Simon takes over, the dynasty continues. Following the death of James in 62 AD, Eusebius reported that the remaining apostles gathered with those left of the family of the Lord, and they took counsel together as to who would succeed James. He wrote that, They all unanimously decided that Simeon the son of Clophus was worthy of the throne. Eusebius noted that this Clophus, mentioned in the Gospel of John, was the brother of Joseph, husband of Mary, and thus also of Davidic lineage. We can presume Peter was still alive when James died. That the apostles chose Simon shows just how important the Jesus dynasty was in their thinking. But what about Peter? Unfortunately, we have very little reliable history regarding Peter from the death of Jesus to the death of James. The best we can do is take Paul at his word, that Peter was allied with James, and thus we can assume he shared the legacy of the Jesus dynasty and endorsed and preached its message, the message he too had received from Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, Peter is told by Jesus that he will be given the keys of the kingdom, which Roman Catholics take to indicate that he was put in charge of the Jesus movement. But the transition from Jesus to James to Simon appears to be well documented. So what were the keys of the kingdom? The image is a biblical one taken from the book of Isaiah. To have the key of David is to be like a chief of staff over a royal household or administration. What Jesus was promising Peter was not succession, but that he would occupy the right-hand position of responsibility, which he did in service to James, who was of the house of David. There is a tradition that Peter died side by side with Paul in Rome during the reign of Nero. Eusebius says Peter was crucified, but later legends circulated that he insisted on being nailed upside down to his cross, since he was unworthy to die in the manner Jesus had died. It is difficult to know how much weight to give to this tradition that Peter died in Rome, since the Roman Catholic Church subsequently made such claim to him as its first bishop or pope. One has to wonder whether stories about Peter as a martyr in Rome are more theological than historical. I have already mentioned the ossuary found on the Mount of Olives inscribed with Peter's full Aramaic name, Simeon bar Jonas. This name is otherwise unknown in any Jewish record. Whether the ossuary is Peter's or not, Jerusalem seems a more likely resting place for Peter, in the area where Jesus, James, and the Jesus family were all buried. It is worth noting that Eusebius and Epiphanius offer us independent lists of the successors of James the Just. They both record Simon as second and one named Jude or Judas as third. The apostolic constitutions related to our Didache but compiled much later in the 4th century A.D., say that the third person in line, the Jude who succeeded Simon, was a third brother of Jesus. The possibility is quite significant in that it would trace the Jesus dynasty through four successive brothers, Jesus, James, Simon, and Judas. We simply cannot know, but what we can know with some certainty is that the royal family of Jesus, including the children and grandchildren of his brothers and sisters, were honored by the early Christians well into the 2nd century A.D., while at the same time they were watched and hunted down by the highest levels of the Roman government in Palestine. The decades of the 40s, 50s, and 60s A.D., both in Palestine and the larger Roman Empire, were years of chaos and instability with political unrest, violence, rebellions, and wars. This provided a backdrop in Palestine in particular for a messianic fervor the likes of which had never before been seen. It seemed obvious to all who had an eye and ear for what the Hebrew prophets had predicted, that the last days were swiftly drawing to a close and the long-anticipated kingdom of God had drawn near. A full-scale Jewish revolt had broken out in Palestine in 66 A.D., Jerusalem fell into the control of several rebel factions. Nero appointed a Spanish general, Vespasian, to crush the revolt, and several legions poured into the country. 
By 68 AD, Vespasian had crushed all opposition and moved south into Judea to lay siege to Jerusalem. When Nero committed suicide in 68 AD, Vespasian left the war in Judea and the siege of Jerusalem in the hands of his son Titus, and he traveled to Rome where he succeeded in becoming emperor. In the summer of 69 AD, the new emperor Vespasian returned to Jerusalem, rejoining his son Titus to personally conduct the final stages of the siege. Jerusalem was surrounded by four Roman legions. Including auxiliary troops, the Roman forces numbered over 50,000. By the spring of 70 AD, severe famine had set in. Josephus reports that some even resorted to cannibalism, and chaos reigned inside the besieged city. Those who sought to escape were captured and crucified. As many as 500 per day were captured and crucified in order to terrorize those inside and force surrender. By summer, the Romans had constructed ramps and were able to breach the walls and enter the city by stages. They set fire to the city and raised the walls to the ground. Finally, the temple itself, with its vast complex of buildings and courts, was burnt and utterly demolished. The Jewish-Roman War was a tragedy beyond measure for the religion of Judaism and for the nation. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple left the Jewish people without a national and religious center. Thousands were taken prisoner and tens of thousands died. There was a great triumphal march in Rome to celebrate the victory of Vespasian with Jewish captives and booty from the temple, including its sacred vessels paraded through the streets. The causes of the war were complex, but Josephus, having lived through it all, drew a most startling conclusion when he wrote, But what more than all else incited them to the war was an ambiguous oracle, likewise found in their sacred scriptures, to the effect that at that time one from their country would become ruler of the world. What Josephus asserts here is that the chief cause of the war was a religious one involving the expectation of the coming of the Jewish Davidic Messiah. The population was convinced that God would intervene and not only rout the Romans from Palestine, but, as the Hebrew prophets had predicted, establish his chosen king as ruler over all nations. But in retrospect, after the disaster of the war and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, Josephus charged that his pious countrymen had misread or overlooked a key portion of the prophecy from Daniel. Josephus wrote, After the sixty-two weeks, that is, four hundred and eighty-three years, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing, and the troops of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The world ruler who comes is none other than the emperor Vespasian, who does indeed destroy the city and the sanctuary. So who then would be the anointed one or Messiah who is cut off? Josephus says nothing about that, but the followers of Jesus had read Daniel's prophecy in a similar way, even before the disaster of the Roman War. Their interpretation was likely spurred by the tragic and unexpected murder of their leader James the Just in 62 AD. James descended from the royal line of David and thus aptly called a Messiah or anointed one, had indeed been killed precisely seven years before the Romans laid siege to the city of Jerusalem in the summer of 69 AD. That was seven years short of the completion of the 490-year period, precisely as Daniel had predicted. In their view, the end of the age could not be long following. Eusebius and Epiphanius preserve a tradition that the Jerusalem followers of Jesus, now led by Simon son of Clophus, fled the city of Jerusalem just before the siege in response to an oracle given by revelation before the war. They reported that the followers settled in the area of the Decapolis city of Pella, just a few miles north of the biblical Wadi Kareth, the traditional place where Elijah hid from danger, and very likely the area where Jesus had spent the last winter of his life hiding from Herod Antipas, the Jesus hideout in Jordan. If Simon, leader of the group at this time, was in fact the brother of Jesus, as I have argued, the flight in 66 AD would be a return trip for him after 40 years. 
How many of these Jerusalem Christians might have followed Simon we cannot say. It is moving to imagine this loyal band of followers of the Jesus dynasty making their way to their place, living in those caves surrounded by the steep cliffs, and awaiting the hope that had been kindled by John the Baptizer forty years earlier. Josephus reports that refugees fled the advancing Roman armies in all directions. This is the period when the Essene settlement at Qumran was abandoned and the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden in the surrounding caves. We know that 960 Jewish refugees ended up in the Judean desert to the south at the fortress of Masada. It was there that they committed suicide in the spring of 73 AD after a prolonged Roman siege. Masada became the last stand of Jewish resistance. It is possible, even likely, that Jewish followers of Jesus were included in that group. In November 1963, during the first season of excavations at Masada, in a remote cave at the southern end of the fortress, the skeletons of 24 men, women, and children were discovered, seemingly removed from the main body of zealot rebels who occupied the northern area. They appear to be a sectarian group, and it is possible that they were a group of Essenes or even Nazarenes who had joined the others in flight. The Jesus Dynasty Lost and Forgotten We have no good historical record for these early Palestinian Christians during the period from the flight to Pella in 66 AD to the execution of the aged Simon during the reign of Trajan, probably around 106 AD. Eusebius reported that after the revolt, the emperor Vespasian ordered a search be made for all who were of the family of David, that there might be left among the Jews no one of the royal family, and for this reason a great persecution was again inflicted on the Jews. Simon and any other relatives of the family of Jesus were probably in hiding or at least maintaining a low profile. Hegesippus related a fascinating story preserved by Eusebius in which two grandsons of Jesus' brother Jude were arrested, questioned, and released during the reign of Domitian. Hegesippus wrote that they were leaders in the churches because of their witness to the origins of the movement and their relation to the Lord. Hegesippus goes on to say that Simon's crucifixion was part of a roundup of any of the royal house of the Jews. We have no record of Jude's manner of death. Being Jewish at all was becoming increasingly unpopular in the Roman world. During the years 132 to 135 AD, a second, even more bloody Jewish revolt erupted in Palestine during the reign of the Emperor Hadrian. It was led by Simon bar Kosaba, known subsequently in history as bar Kokhba, who had been accepted by many Jews as the Davidic Messiah. As punishment, the Romans forbade Jews to even enter the city of Jerusalem. A temple dedicated to Jupiter was built over the site of the ruins of the Jewish temple. Any hope of the kingdom of God being realized on earth had begun to fade, and Jewish messianic fervor grew cold. Paul's gospel, which focused on salvation and a kingdom of God not on earth but in heaven, had an increased appeal to many. We do know that these original Christians survived, mostly in the areas east of Palestine well into the 4th century AD, but they were scattered and without power, and they had little to no part in influencing what went into the New Testament. They were known subsequently by the term Ebionites, which meant in Hebrew, poor ones. Eusebius knows of them, though he considers them heretics in contrast to the Christian orthodoxy that he championed. Among his charges was that the Ebionites made Jesus a plain and ordinary man, born naturally from Mary and her husband. Eusebius further stated that the Ebionites insisted on observance of the Jewish law or Torah and that they maintained that salvation was by works as well as faith, as the letter of James affirms. The Ebionites rejected the letters of the Apostle Paul and considered him an apostate from the original faith. They used only a Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, now lost to us other than in fragments. Eusebius, allied with the Emperor Constantine, who had turned to Christianity himself by 325 AD, 
classified each of these Ebionite views as heretical, and yet their views are grounded in the teachings of Jesus himself and that tradition passed on by his brothers. It is only now, through the discovery of lost documents, the insights gained by new archaeological discoveries, and a critical reading of the New Testament and other historical records, that we are in a position to begin to put many of the pieces of the puzzle together. The legacy of the Jesus dynasty is at last coming to light with exciting results for those who wish to hear again the original teachings of Jesus. I began the story of the Jesus dynasty with a tale of two tombs and their possible relationship to the ancient burial ossuary that was inscribed in Aramaic, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. It is as if the surfacing of the James ossuary and the discovery of the two tombs, whatever turns out to be their final disposition, have somehow signaled for us the material reality of a hidden and forgotten story of the utmost significance. An understanding of the Jesus dynasty offers us much more than an interesting alternative to the standard ways in which Christian history has been presented. It opens for us new avenues of thinking about the significance of Jesus of Nazareth and what his life and teachings can mean to us. Jesus was the most influential figure in human history, and who he was and how he is remembered matters greatly to all of us, whether secular or religious whether Christian, Jewish, or Muslim.